Hi guys, I come to you another week, another video. This time I'm hoping to, I'm talking to you rather about the Intel Core i9-10980XE CPU. Now, the CPU has been out for a while. I think it came out in October 2019. And since then there's been a, now I wanna say barrage, but there's been quite a few reviews um, with various conclusions, outcomes, opinions, and so forth, whether on YouTube, websites, and even believe it or not, print media. So these are my opinions. These are, this is my thoughts on it. This is my experience on it. I'm not necessarily here to tell you if you should buy it or not. This is not about recommending something or not. I'm just telling you what it's like living with the CPU and the various configurations I've tried with it. Because ultimately for me, such a CPU represents options. More than anything else, it's just options, right? And I'll go into that a little bit later on so you understand exactly what I mean. But before we get into that, let's just get into the meat and potatoes of it, right? So the 10980XE isn't really any different from something that we saw in all the way back, I think in 2017 when X299 came out. Um, actually, I could be wrong about that, but at some point, I think, no, it was. Yeah, it was 2017 or something like that when we had the 7980XE, the first 18 core CPU, and it was really, really, really powerful, really impressive. And yeah, it was only the only game in town, really, at the time. So if you wanted ultimate performance for your desktop PC, that's the CPU you had to go for. Obviously, now in 2019, or more specifically in 2020 now, there's a whole lot more options. The competition has options, so you're not limited to just 18 cores. You can go even higher should you have the budget and the willingness or the need for that sort of thing. Either way, here I'm just looking at this 18 core CPU, which is literally the highest spec CPU that Intel sells, at least for desktop systems, right? So yeah, I'm here to just let you know that um, I generally like the CPU. Unlike most people, or at least most reviews that I've read, I don't necessarily see this as a failure of sorts or anything like that. I actually just see it as another option in a world of options. You just pick the one that works for you. For instance, if you're already invested in X299 and you have a fairly decent uh, motherboard, I think this is as a drop-in upgrade, this might be make sense for you depending on what you had before. Either way, let's just get on with the numbers. So as you know, the CPU has a TDP of 165 watts, that's what Intel is selling, and a max boost frequency of 4.8 gigahertz, and another one of 4.6 gigahertz, and a nominal clock of 3.4 gigahertz when all the cores are loaded, essentially, right? So looking at power consumption, um, I only compared the 9900KS, the, the AMD 3800X, just for reference, and obviously this 10980XE CPU. Let's looking at power consumption. Out the box, okay, when things are operating normally and when you don't allow the motherboard to exceed the specification, actually, which is a thing, a lot of motherboards, or at least it seems like when I read some of the reviews that I saw earlier, they had some really high performance figures, particularly in Cinebench, I would see something like 8,800 points on Cinebench 20. And when I ran the CPU, I couldn't get anywhere near that. I was getting between 7,600 and 7,770 maybe at most, only to find out that I can reproduce those results if I let the motherboard exceed the specified TDP. So allowing it to do that, which is I think is um, an all core enhance and basically ignoring the, 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 the specifications for power draw, However, if you stick to specifications, right, the numbers are more reasonable, like 7,700 or around there for the CPU, the 10980XE at reference. Either way, testing this under Prime95 and testing it under um, Cinebench R20, you see some different things, of course. Under Prime95, the CPU pretty much stays at 3.3 gigahertz and 3.4 gigahertz. Actually, it's just very rarely at 3.3. It was mostly 3.4 gigahertz, right? It was just 3.4 gigahertz continuously. And at the time, the low temperature, I think, was 54 degrees or 55 degrees, which is really, really low. But I just found that to be really impressive. And then when you go to Cinebench R20, you basically end up at 3.7 gigahertz sometimes, so 3.8 gigahertz briefly, and then it would come down to 3.5 and just hover around there. But even then, the low temperature was 3 point, was, was sorry, was three, uh, 55 degrees. So that's 
just phenomenal for me. I mean, if I could load the CPU with such programs and then come out with such a low operating temperature and a reasonable power draw, I'm, I'm more than happy. So in terms of that, uh, yeah, 165 watts, 55 uh, degrees uh, Celsius low temperature, um, I think that's pretty awesome. But obviously, being who we are, enthusiasts, overclockers and so forth, we never run any CPU at stock if we have the option of going faster or changing different levers to get different performance. And to that extent, when you start overclocking the CPU, it can consume a ton of power. In fact, you can more than double its power consumption. I think at five gigahertz, if I'm not mistaken, um, Elmo over at OCN said that the CPU consumed up to 500 or just over 500 watts. That was the CPU package power, right? I suspect it was CPU package power. At five gigahertz, the CPU could pull over 500 watts, which is a lot, which is a hell of a lot. Obviously, it's not something that you're going to use every day, but the fact that it's capable of doing that is impressive. But with that comes the ridiculous power draw and the super high temperatures. I think the temperatures was over 100 degrees or something like that. Either way, when you start overclocking, that's when things get a little bit interesting. And for the most part, this is what I've just been trying to balance. I've been trying to balance temperatures, power consumption, and performance. Because I do really do believe the CPU is about options. And if you can find the right balance between those all three things, then yeah, you can basically get uh, the, the performance that you need, that you're willing to live with. And more importantly, won't actually cost you much in terms of electricity, cooling, and so forth. I think at 4.6 gigahertz, I actually configured the CPU to different, in fact, before I tell you at 4.6 gigahertz, let me just tell you the various configurations that I had for the CPU, right? So I had three main configurations to test out different things. So I configured the CPU similarly to the 9900KS, so that means 8 cores, 16 threads, 5 gigahertz. Now for that, I needed 1.28 volts. Okay, so that's a little bit more. In fact, it's actually a lot more than what I needed on the 9900KS, which we reviewed in the last issue of the magazine. On that CPU, I actually only need about 1.2 volts, so it's slightly under less than that to do 5 gigahertz on all cores, right? Whereas here, I need 1.28. So obviously, that has repercussions. One of the repercussions being that I pull a lot more power. In fact, on the Cinebench R20, this configuration draws up to 254 watts. The other configuration I have is 4600 megahertz, and that's with just 18 cores and 18 threads. That needed 1.15 volts, right? And during Cinebench, the same Cinebench test, I think that draws, actually, there's no need for me to speculate. We can just look at it. That draws 290 watts. Yes, that draws 290 watts at its peak during the same test. So it's obvious it's not actually a lot. I mean, yes, you sacrifice 400 megahertz compared to the five gigahertz run, but you also gain significantly more threads or rather cores, even though you don't get necessarily many more threads, but the performance is far, 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 far better, right? In multi-threaded tests. So at 290 watts, that's just nine to 40 watts more, right? For significantly better performance in the threaded tests. And then the other test that I did, the configuration that I tested was 4400 megahertz, which was the realistic limit for the CPU was all threads enabled, right? The reason I say realistic limit is because while I could do 4.5 gigahertz and I think even 4.6 gigahertz, the power consumption just shot through the roof and the temperatures were too high. And so that's obviously not a configuration I can use. The interesting thing about the required voltage to operate all these three configurations is that we go from 1.28 volts as I mentioned earlier at 4.6 gigahertz with just 18 cores and 18 threads you're looking at 1.15 volts and 4400 megahertz is 1.05 volts which is pretty awesome right I think that's really really cool because I can get really great performance but minimize on the power consumption and the heat generated. And speaking to that, actually, if you just look at the graph, the graph that's showing up right now, you might think that 
the 4.4 gigahertz configuration is simply not worth it because yes at its peak during prime 95 it does pull up to 411 watts whereas the 4.6 gigahertz config is 408 and so forth going down however i don't spend my time running prime 95 or even cinebench right i spend my time in coding video doing that sort of thing or playing games and when you are playing games this 4400 megahertz configuration consumes a lot less power than the other two right um, what i'm talking about is for instance look at this power draw for the 5 gigahertz configuration was 168 watts that's i'm talking package power now cpu package power 168 watts for the 4600 megahertz configuration which is just 18 cores as you know that's 166 watts but for the 4400 megahertz configuration, I was drawing only 151 watts, which is less than TDB, right? And I'm still getting better performance. Now, I think that's a win. So you're looking at 470 watts for the five gigahertz config, uh, 474 watts peak for the 4600 megahertz config, and 454 watts for 4400 megahertz. Again, this, for me is the best configuration between uh, performance power draw and heat and talking about heat during gameplay running 4400 megahertz allowed the cpu to stay at a peak of 57 degrees but mostly 54 degrees celsius compare that with running 5 gigahertz where the peak temperature was 68 degrees and the average temperature was 62 degrees so obviously I'm getting a lot of um, heat generated by just increasing the frequency. I mean, you can see that even at 4.6 gigahertz with the 18 core configuration or rather 18 thread configuration, the peak temperatures were 60 degrees and low temperature, uh, the peak temperatures were 60 degrees and average temperature was 55. I guess that one is not too bad. In fact, that's, you can live with that, that's fine. But if you can save, on the package power and even the wall socket power, then why not, right? Let's do that. But see, yeah, so far those are just my general thoughts on the CPU. I'll bring you more thoughts later on and bring you more results. But in the meantime, just yeah, take a look at these results and hopefully they allow you to see that there's, there's some life in the CPU and it just might be worth owning if you already invested in the platform or you're really not interested in using something from the competition. Okay then, so that's generally it about my thoughts on the CPU, the 10980XE. As far as I'm concerned, when just evaluating the CPU, I think it represents a lot of options and it's something that I generally like and I find quite favorable. I hope this was insightful and helps you make a decision or formulate an opinion of some sort. I'll leave you with the benchmarks. Until next time, take care.